Well, thank you very much, um, Audrey, um, for the um, invitation and for the introduction. So today I'm going to speak to you about some work that uh, myself and Nick Harpers have been doing at the labs at Harriet Watt, analysing the transport properties of fault-related geothermal systems in Cornwall. So this research forms part of the GWAT project, which is uh, NERC funded, and I will come on to that in a second. So just before I actually come on to our research in particular, I thought I'd give a very quick overview of ge the geothermal energy potential in Cornwall. So on the left hand side is a map of the UK, which shows heat flow with the warmer colours, the reds and oranges, uh, showing areas of elevated heat flow. So the place which it stands out most in this map is down in the southwest of England in Cornwall. So here you, you also have elevated geothermal gradients uh, in comparison to the rest of the UK. So the average geothermal gradient in the UK is about 25, 26 degrees Celsius per kilometre. In Cornwall, it can be as high as 38 degrees Celsius per kilometre. And the reason that you have such, um, such high heat flow in Cornwall is because the area is, is underlined by, by granite. And these granites uh, have elevated amounts of radiogenic elements, uranium, thorium, potassium, and over time these decay and give off heat. So on the right hand side is a map of, um, that shows some of these, the surface exposures of some of these granites. Now the granites are maybe slightly different in terms of their composition, but I don't want to go into that today. The main thing I want you to take away from, from this slide is the fact that uh, there has been interest in geothermal energy in Cornwall for some time. In the 1980s, there was a project, um, the Hot Dry Rock project, um, where a couple of wells were drilled into the Carmenellis granite. And uh, then there was a bit of a hiatus in terms of interest before uh, the United Downs project was, was kicked off um, in the last 10, 15 years. And that again was drill, drilling wells into the Carmenellis granite. And then even more recent than that in the last year, year and a half, is the Eden project where a well has been drilled into the St. Austell granite. So the, the play type of uh, in, in Eden in United Downs is very, very similar. Uh, and I'll come on to that now. So, I mean, having, having a heat source is one thing, but uh, being able to extract that heat is another. So at United Downs, where the heat source is the Carmenellis granite, um, so granite being a crystalline rock doesn't have a very well, uh, a very good Poor network, which is uh, which is connected, like you may have in a lot of sedimentary rocks. So any any fluid flow is um, is rel you're reliant on fractures in a connected fracture network for any fluid flow through the system. So for United Downs, there were two wells drilled uh, where the target reservoir was the Port Town fault, fault zone. So a fault zone uh, has a it's, it's it's known that fault zones have a pervasive fracture network within the damage zone. Uh, this can be well connected and can transmit fluids. So for United Downs, there were two wells drilled to intercept this fault, uh, one at uh, intercepting it at about two, just over two kilometers deep and the other at five kilometers deep. And at five kilometers, the temperature was um, recorded of being about 180, 190 degrees. And water is produced from this deep well uh, up to surface reaching, uh, so when it comes to surface, it's about 170, 175 degrees, and that's enough to be able to produce power. So once heat is taken out of the, out of the water, it's re-injected into, um, into the reservoir uh, through the shallow well, and then over time, that water will heat up again. So our research focus within GWAD is to characterize the reservoir in terms of permeability. So trying to understand um, are there any particular rock types within the fault zone which are more permeable than others? And uh, if that is the case, why is that the case? And that's a good uh, proxy for energy production because it gives you an idea of how much fluid you can extract um, at, over any time period. The next thing that uh, we're also looking at um, is the frictional properties of uh, different rocks within the fault zone. And um, that is by doing friction experiments on, on different rocks at different pressure and temperature conditions um, that are relevant for the operational parameters of this project. But uh, I won't be talking to you about that today because the work is still ongoing. So my, the focus of this talk is on the permeability data that we've acquired. So in terms of samples, we have um, collected samples of Carmen Ellis granite 
from Holman's test mine. So Holman's test mine is it's a mine goes into the into the Carmen Ellis granite. It's quite extensive, has lots of fault structures within it. Um, and on the right hand side, we have a, a photo of one of these fault structures where you have the pen, uh, the pen here is um, about where the, the fault core is. And the rock surrounding here is, is uh, very weak. You can pull it apart with your hands, it's that weak. And then as you move away from the fault core, the, the rock becomes more competent. Um, and you also see a change in color um, as, as, as you move away from the fault core as well. So the Porth Town fault zone doesn't actually um, go through here. We, we couldn't sample rocks from there, but um, the, the, our samples are from a fault structure, which we believe to be an, a good analog of the Porth Town fault zone. And at the bottom here, we have photos of, or a photo of three samples um, taken from material from, um, from Holman's test mine that we've actually tested. On the left-hand side is what we are calling the unaltered Carmenellis granite. Um, and then on the far right-hand side is what we're calling the highly altered Carmenellis granite. And as you can see, there is a, a distinct difference in terms of their color. But also, if you were to be able to handle these samples, you'd be able to break apart this um, sample of highly altered granite in your hands. Uh, you wouldn't be able to do that with the unaltered stuff. And then in the middle, we have uh, what we're calling the slightly altered uh, material. So whereas the unaltered is, is taken from very far away from any, any uh, fault structure, and the highly altered material is from uh, very close to the fault core, the slightly altered material is uh, somewhere in between. So we have recently acquired some porosity and uh, mineralogical data for these rocks. Um, first of all, I'll draw attention to the porosity. So the porosity of the unaltered and the slightly altered granite is very, very similar. It's uh, very low, less than 2%. Uh, whereas the highly altered material has a porosity of, of 10%, so a, an order of magnitude higher. The second thing I want to draw your attention to is the, the difference in the amount of plagioclase between the unaltered and the highly altered uh, granite. So where the unaltered um, granite has about 20% uh, of, of plagioclase and the highly altered material has uh, next to nothing. And this is quite interesting. And um, the, there's other authors have done some, some work on the St. Austell granites, it's John, John Coggan et al. Um, and what they found was that as you had more, as the Senosal granite became more altered, you had a, a decrease in the amount of plagioclase primarily, an increase in its, prior, uh, in its porosity, um, and an increase in, in terms of clay. So we definitely see a decrease in the, the amount of plagioclase, um, an increase in the porosity. The, the, the increase in clay is something that's a bit difficult to tease out at the moment, but this is preliminary data, and we're, we're in, in the middle of, of gathering more data on this to get a more robust data set. But broadly speaking, it's kind of what we expected. So in terms of uh, permeability measurements, so we measured the permeability of both intact and fractured cores. So on the right-hand side, you can see there is, um, uh, the left-hand picture there is of an intact core, and then on the right-hand side is a fractured core. So the fractured core is an intact sample, which we have then induced a fracture in using the Brazil disk test method. So this is an induced fracture, not a natural fracture, and it is also a mode one fracture. So just keep that in mind. And then we put the samples one at a time in the pressure vessel and uh, below, uh, which it sits within an oven. And we used the a combination of the steady state and the unsteady state methods to, to measure the permeability of these samples. Now I won't go into the, the real nitty gritty of these different uh, methods, but we used the unsteady state to measure the permeability of really low permeability samples. Um, but we also did uh, experiments on um, one sample using both methods and found that the results uh, were very comparable. So um, it's just to, the thing I want to draw your attention to is the fact that we can we're happy with comparing results from these two different methods. The next thing to note is that we use nitrogen as a working fluid rather than water, but then we use the Klinkenberg correction to calculate the equivalent liquid permeability. So this is something that's uh, routinely done in um, uh, permeability experiments. Um, and uh, again, we, we, we did a water flood experiment and uh, did an experiment uh, using gas uh, with a Klinkenberg correction and the results of both were comparable. So again, we are happy with this methodology. The reason we didn't use water for all of the experiments is because it takes significantly longer to do the experiments for um, um, and to get to a, a steady state. And um, within the timeframe of the project, that just wasn't feasible. 
So in terms of actual data, so here I'm, I'm presenting data, uh, permeability data from the slightly altered uh, material and the highly altered material. Both of these are intact samples, not fractured. Um, and it's permeability on the y-axis, where um, the two the scales of the two graphs are, are, are different, so note that. And on the x-axis, it's effective stress, where effective stress is the confining pressure minus the pore fluid pressure. And for each of our experiments, we kept the pore fluid pressure the same, but uh, modified the confining pressure. The thing I want you to take away from this slide is the fact that um, the permeability of the slightly altered material is very, very low. We're talking 10, 10 times 10 to the minus 20 and lower. So over engineering time scales, it's effectively uh, impermeable. In comparison, you have the highly altered material, um, which has permeability of three orders of magnitude or more higher over the same effective stress range. So there is the potential for flow in this altered material. And this is something that we have not um, seen, you know, has, has been really looked at in the literature. Um, not, not that we're aware of anyway, but there is the potential to flow. Now, we are also currently testing a sample of an altered material, but we haven't got the whole data set yet. So I'm not presenting it here, but initial results are similar to those of the slightly altered material. So that was the, that was the first thing we found that was quite interesting. Now, the second thing is the, um, when we measured the permeability of fractured samples, um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm plotting slightly altered and highly altered carbonellous granite on left and right, respectively. Um, here, the, the permeability axis are the same on both graphs, so you can make an easy direct comparison. Um, and the first thing to note is that the permeability is, uh, of the fractured samples is higher than the intact samples, which is what you'd expect. You've got a big fracture going through it. Um, the, the next thing to note is that the permeability of the slightly altered material is higher than that of the highly altered material, about an old order of magnitude in it. Now, initially, that was a bit of a surprise to me. Um, the, the reason being that the, the fractures uh, are induced in the lab. Uh, they're very similar in terms of um, fractures in both of these samples that we tested. So I would have expected that um, the fact that you had matrix contribution to flow in the highly altered material would likely mean that you had at least the same permeability um, between two samples, or in fact, the highly altered material would be slightly more permeable because you have this matrix contribution. That definitely isn't the case here. And the reason we think that that is not the case is because we know that the highly altered material is a lot weaker. Um, we've measured that in the lab, so it's, we've quantified that as well. Um, and for fluid to flow through fractures, um, or fluid flowing through fractures is dependent on the aperture of your fracture. And the fracture is propped open by asperities on your fracture surface. And if your material is, is weaker, it's likely that those asperities, it's easier to deform those asperities, and therefore your fracture closes. So what we think is that the, the fracture, the aperture of the, in the highly altered sample is smaller than that of the slightly altered sample for that reason. The next thing um, I'd like to, to, to show you as well is here I'm plotting permeability data of just the highly altered material, but now it's the intact sample versus the fractured sample. Um, and what's interesting here is that the, so first of all, the permeability of the fractured sample is higher than the, the intact sample, which is as you'd expect. Um, but the, it's, there's not much in it. This is the same scale on the y-axis again. And it's only about half an order of magnitude in it. So it's not actually that much. And when we compare that to, say, the less altered material, where there's maybe five orders of magnitude difference in terms of the permeability with an intact and a, uh, and a fractured sample, um, this is nowhere near that. And again, we attribute that to the fact that the asperities are probably deforming and the fracture is closing, particularly at these higher effective stresses. And then my summary slide. Um, it's just, there's a table here showing the different, um, the, permeab uh, the permeability or the relative permeabilities between these, these different samples that we've tested. And it's uh, a few things I just want to draw out from this is first of all, that the, um, the int intact samples, there is um, the possibility of flow in the highly altered material, but there, there isn't um, certainly on engineering timescales for the less altered material. Um, but then when you look at fractured samples that um, the, the permeability is much higher for those less altered uh, material. Uh, and again, the reason we think that is the case is that we think that the asperities of the, in the highly altered material are deforming a lot easier and therefore your fracture is closing. 
Now, the one thing I haven't talked about, um, and again, this is, you know, this, this data is uh, hot off the press, as it were, um, but is the storage potential within this highly altered um, material. So it's 10% porosity. Now, so the, the initial thought process of this, um, of this reservoir was that um, most, if not all, of the fluid is stored within the fractures. Now, what we show is that actually these, the, the altered material has the potential to store fluid in it with 10% porosity. And these zones uh, of altered material can be tens of centimetres, they can be even, you know, a metre or so wide, or, you know, it, it really depends on where you are. So the contribution to flow from this altered, um, this altered material, but also the storage potential should definitely not be overlooked. It could be impossible, it could be important, for example, in terms of the lifetime of these kind of projects, where there may be a lot more water or fluid available than, than originally thought. And with that, um, I will finish my talk and if there's any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them.